नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू ओ गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वरा गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरुवे नम ओम भो भो स्वाहा तत्सवित्र वरे नयम भर्गो देव से धीमहे दियो यो न प्रचोदया अस्तो मा सतगम्या तम सो मा ज्योतिर्गम्या मृत्योर्मा अमृतम गम्या ओम सहना वबतु सहना भुनक्तु सह वीर करवा वही तेजस्वी नवधी तमस्तु मा विद्वेशा वही ओम शांति 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 today we gonna look at uh, this word which we often use and it's very well known to us all and this word is culture culture but if somebody asks you what does it mean can we define it what culture is most of the people will find it very very difficult or not very easy to define this word we, which we use all the time one definition i came across for this word is when a group of people live together for a long time in a particular geographical area living certain values the special individuality that emanates from that group is said to be their culture so in this definition of culture there are four important factors number 1 is that a group of people must exist second is that they must live together in a particular area and the third is that they must live there for a long period of time and the fourth is they respect certain common values of life so four things only in such a situation will the unique characteristics of those people be created because if these individuals are spread around one person is living here the other person is living somewhere else in other words if they are constantly roaming around and if they don't have any values in common then you won't find any recognizable culture emerging from them so this special mark or characteristic that develops under above circumstances these four circumstances then we can call it a culture and it's not the characteristic of a only one individual it is a, out of the group as a whole because there is a difference between the group which is which is called community and the individual's nature see this group's nature is called culture individual's nature is different because when certain individual behaves in a particular way we generally say that that is his nature but when a community responds to different situations in a particular way we say it is a culture so the difference is that that with respect to one person's mode of behavior we call it nature with respect to a community we call it a culture but they definitely influence each other 
but the individual will be influenced by the community and total also gets affected by the individuals. But first let us uh, understand the meaning and significance of each term by itself. In Sanskrit, we call the individual's nature sanskar. Sanskar. In a family with three or four children, even though each is born into the same culture, like a family, we find that each individual behaves differently. Then we ask if they are all born in the same family, the same culture, same country, then why does each person behave differently? The answer to that is that it's that person's individual sanskar or sabhav. And everybody's actions are in accordance with this particular sanskars or tendencies. And when it comes to a group, however, we say that the group's mode of behavior and response is its culture. Culture differs from very much from place to place. Even in the Eastern hem Hemisphere, for example, the Middle Eastern countries are different from Far Eastern countries. And in India, it's again different from both. When we see in the West, we call it a Western countries when we are in India or in the East, we say Western. We see the European culture is different than the American culture. Even though we call it a Western culture, but even in American culture, if you travel, you see Californian culture and the people who live in New York different. People in the South, the people in the North, the culture, the group of people. So differences are contained when we look at it this way. Let us look at uh, actual Sanskrit word for culture and its meaning and its deeper implication. In Sanskrit, the word for culture is Sanskriti. Sanskriti. Kritam means that which is done. Sam means very well. So Sanskriti means that which is very well made, very well refined. So that means we can just look at that, hey, this is the culture. Therefore, even the Sanskrit language itself is that which is well refined, purified language. And in terms of behavior, when we speak of culture, we also mean a kind of a refinement. We often say that an individual is cultured. His behavior is cultured. And that person may not be well educated. Many times we see that people with higher degrees could show a lot of arrogance. And arrogance is not a sign of a cultured person. But to fully understand this concept of Sanskriti, we must understand two other basic points. First point is the concept of Prakriti, which we generally translate as a nature. The inherent nature or tendency of a thing is called its prakriti. For example, animals have urges such as hunger, thirst, feeling of fear or insecurity, and the need for sleep. And they live according to these tendencies, these desires, urges. And this is considered their prakriti their nature, animal nature. 
human beings also the same feelings of fear hunger thirst desire for progeny these are natural urges when a person feels hunger and goes in search of food the action is called prakriti that means the action is in accordance to the nature there is nothing wrong in this as long as we are acting according to nature there is no problem but we all know that there is a difference between the urges of an animal and urges of a human being animals urges are pers- urges and even the pursuits are controlled by nature they remain within limits they never transgress so animals behavior is true to its prakriti you can say for example when a dog has satisfied its hunger it will not eat any more if there is more food then the dog would just hide it dig a hole in the ground keep the food for later use when the dogs are sick they will not eat anything so nature or their prakriti has given them this understanding but on the other hand human beings no matter what kind of a sickness we have even if our stomach is upset first question will ask what can i eat just cannot control eating so the difference is that the animals remain true to their prakriti they do not transgress it and even we see that animals desire for progeny is according to season everything is controlled in sanskrit there is a another word so one is prakriti the other one is vikriti so sanskriti prakriti vikriti so vikriti what is that vikriti can be translated in english as a perversion when some urge or desire grows out of proportion and we transgress the control and the limits of prakriti it becomes vikriti so it's no longer prakriti it's a perversion now for example when i feel tired naturally i sleep i take rest for some time to revive myself then again begin to work so here the sleep is not a problem it is not a vikriti but if someone sleeps for 16 hours at a stretch or keep on relaxing then something is wrong it is not natural it has turned into vikriti there are people who sleep 10 to 12 hours and still say i think i got up too early this morning that's a vikriti so 12 hours of sleep is abnormal and unnatural and it's called vikriti so in the same way when i'm hungry and want to eat that is prakriti if i continue to eat like a glutton in order to satisfy my taste buds i'm ready to do anything kill animals also even destroy the nature to fulfill my desire then it's a vikriti that's a perversion and we see that what's happening in this world because of this vikriti human beings are blessed with the faculty of thinking which we call buddhi which allows a lot of freedom we are in a karma yoni we are free to do whatever we want to do 
Freedom is there. God has given us this freedom. It's a great opportunity for us. But how do we use this freedom? Either I can construct myself or I can destruct myself. Both are possible. I have a freedom to drive the car. And if I don't obey the laws, sure, I'll kill myself and somebody else too. But if I use that freedom properly, I can enhance myself. So this faculty of thinking is a blessing if we use it rightly. If we do not know how to use it properly, it can become a curse. Our prakriti, our nature can become an obsession and abnormality. What we need to do is to control. That's what a yogi guru says. Yam niyam sar for that. Control yourself. Discipline yourself. The great yogic scripture, Yoga Sutras by Patanjali, it started with that, the very first verse, at yoga nushashnam, live a disciplined life. If you want to be a cultured person, refine your behavior. So in order to refine, we need to prevent prakriti from turning into vikriti. What do we need for that? We need a Sanskriti culture. More education or rising to higher positions, earning more money, more power will not necessarily make one a cultured person. Because a person's mind may yet remain animalistic. It is very difficult to explain what culture is because it cannot be taught through discourses. That's why they say culture cannot be taught, but it can be caught. It can be caught. That's why our scriptures constantly, again and again, they tell us be aware of your company. The company you keep has a direct effect on you. Just as children automatically pick up what, whichever language is spoken at home without being taught, that's why it's called mother tongue. Culture is also picked up the same way. If we constantly instruct the children on, on do's and don'ts, but we ourselves keep on behaving differently, they will not follow our instructions. Children do what they see adults doing. They don't do what we say. Maybe in front of us, maybe they'll do it out of fear. But later on, they'll keep on doing what we do because it has been caught by example. Example always speaks louder than words. So as parents, we got to be very careful. As leaders, we have to be very careful. Living life based on noble values is the most important point concerning culture. Why do we need values? Why do we need to respect them and live by them? Because in the human beings, there's always a danger of his culture or nature transgressing its limits and becoming a perversion. Because before we know, the prakriti has become vikriti. So we got to be very alert because this is what we see in the world today. Things are running fine and little carelessness everything is going towards the wrong direction. 
greed for money greed for power greed for position that greed is a vikriti that's not a sanskriti that's why we see the bullies in the classrooms bullies in the at the business place in the world of politics it definitely shows the absence of something absence of refinement one may be rich well educated scholar politically powerful person but he may not have the refinement of character which is called sanskriti the beauty of a person does not lie in his physical educational or other capabilities but in his culture because this culture is uh, being expressed day to day life how a person sits how a person talks how a person behaves that's culture another question is how many different kinds of cultures there are we all know that there are many communities each one has its own culture own traditions but mainly if we look at it we can divide or classify these cultures into two two general groups material culture and spiritual culture and we need to understand these words very carefully and let me give you the sanskrit terms for it then it's a little clearer the material culture is called bhautik sanskriti bhautik okay b h a u t i c bhautik and the spiritual culture is called the adhyatmik sanskriti so two groups adhyatmik okay a d h y a t i m i c adhyatmik okay so these terms are often misunderstood we generally think that materialistic culture means to go on enjoying just to eat drink and be merry but this is a very superficial way of looking at it and at the same time people have the notion that the person who is following the spiritual culture has to renounce everything to run off to the mountains or into the caves and just sit there so when we look at it very superficially we will say that one person is saying enjoy the world and the other is saying escape run away from the world everything in it is bad so go somewhere far away that's a very superficial way of looking at it the follower of the materialistic culture who does not fully understand spiritual culture says you people are just getting poorer and poorer your culture is useless and those of the spiritual culture say to the materialistic person you are only running after the objects going through stress and strain tension and temptations what kind of a life is that most people do not have a clear understanding of what material culture is and a spiritual culture is it is not that one is good and the other one is bad it's not like that at all that's why our rishi is when they even defined the dharma they said dharma is abhyutya nishraya so dharma outer prosperity and inner peace both that is our dharma and when we follow the dharma we are a cultured person outer prosperity should not be neglected but the inner peace also inner joy inner bliss 
should not be neglected either. Need to keep a balance. So we should understand that it is not the world itself that is good or bad, but how we look at the world that matters. Depending on our attitudes, values, our ways of living will be different. Neither philosophy, so if you call it as philosophy, materialistic philosophy and a spiritual philosophy, neither philosophy should be taken to an extreme but each should be kept in balance. Because when we go into the extremes, only then we see that these two philosophies contradict each other. Otherwise, we'll see that there's no contradiction. The philosophy of a materialistic culture gives the most reality to that which is a solid, gross, tangible, and perceivable by the senses. That's why it's called Bhautik, Bhut Padart. And when we further investigate into the nature of matter, it is emphasized along the application of that knowledge in particular ways to make our lives more comfortable. So this materialistic culture has given us the air-conditioned houses. The fully carpeted homes, attached bathrooms, big homes, cars, computers, the phones, all that has come from Bhautik culture. So the materialist does not accept the ex existence of the unseen though. Okay. So they say, they say that, yeah, whatever we see, we believe in it. So they do not believe, they do not accept the existence of the unseen. Or if he does feel that something other than the seen exists, he pays only lip service to it and doesn't want to make further inquiry into it. It may be there, I really don't care. I'm going to worry about what I see, what I can understand. But this kind of a person is adventurous. He wants to know what is in the depths of the oceans, wants to find out, wants to see deep in the earth, in the outer space, in the different planets also. Such investigation is done through the sense organs, the mind, the intellect, and through various kinds of apparatuses equipments, what we see today, the microscopes, the telescopes, the spectroscopes, etc. All of those instruments have come from this kind of a mind. Because these adventurous people, they wanted to find out what is far, far and far away, deep down below, what is extremely subtle. They wanted to study the physics in a molecular way, in atomic physics, in a particle physics, all of that they wanted to learn. They just didn't want to believe in anything unless they see it. And another aspect of the materialistic philosophy is the idea that this whole world is meant for our enjoyment. Materialistic person thinks that he must conquer nature, make it useful for his own personal life. Naturally, there will be a material progress in such a culture. And on the other hand, in the philosophy of spiritual culture, what is unseen is given greater importance than what is seen. The existence of matter is not totally denied, but it is said that which is seen is not alone what is real. There is something though unseen and invisible 
which cannot be said to be non-existent. That means we really cannot see the energy inside us. We cannot see the mind either, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Nobody can say, I'm going to dissect some human body and find the mind in there, but the energy in there. So the spiritual person believes that that which is unseen is what controls the visible. For example, the body moves about and carries on all its functions, but because of what does it function? We are not able to find this out through the sense organs or any other instrument of knowledge. This invisible, which appears to have total control over that which is visible, is the subject of inquiry for the person following the spiritual culture. So spiritually minded people are also adventurous. But their adventure lies in investigating into the unseen that is not experienced through the senses. People of this type exist in every age. Even though the totally, truly spiritual people are rare in the world. Because even the religious people Do not inquire like that. In the old times, the, our rishis, they made that a, their full-time job to really inquire into it. That what is that unseen? What is that power which really controls everything? Because this is like an inherent curiosity in the unseen. We want to know what exists after death, where the person goes. We want to know where the person came from. So that something which exists though unseen is called a spirit according to the spiritual culture. And the inquiry into it is the basis which we call spiritual culture. So in a materialistic culture, the idea exists of conquering and making use of nature for personal convenience. An idea behind a spiritual culture is to live in harmony with nature and finally go beyond nature beyond Prakriti. The spiritual philosophy in the end totally transforms the life of the individual. And not only the individual's life, but even entire community. There's always a foundation or source from which the philosophy of a culture springs forth. The values that are followed by that culture, they are propounded by someone. Sometimes it could be just one person who started that, that great personality, or it could be a group of people. But we have seen that when there's no deep rooted set of values or foundation upon which a culture is based, we find that its philosophy keeps changing every five to 10 years. The people follow whichever ideas are more popular at that time. That's where those terms, the pop culture, the 60s culture, the cultures come and then go. There's no depth to it. On the other hand, we have seen this Sanatan culture, 
the yogic culture, the spiritual culture. It has been here for eons, eons. But in either case, there's always some particular value which predominates, providing the foundation for the direction of the culture at any time. So at the end, what would I like you to remember? We have some basic instincts as human beings. We have the need to eat, need to sleep. We have the need to procreate, need to have a family. But at the same time, we got to remember that this prakriti of ours, do not let it become vikriti. Otherwise, all of this will have the roots in our chit, which will become sanskars. And after this lifetime, we'll take those sanskars with us because the vikriti also has the roots in us. So we want to make this prakriti as a sanskriti. We want to refine it. We want to polish ourselves. We want to have a positive attitude towards life. We should not think that this material nature is bad. It is for our use. But when we get used by it, then big problem comes. We should use these. These objects are there for, for us to use. For example, these phones also, computers also, we need to use them. We are thankful that who created those. But at the same time, if we just, instead of using them, we get used by them, then there's a, that's a vikriti. Just like I told you, the food or the sleep, the same thing goes with other aspects of this material life also. Lord Krishna said very clearly, that a yogi's life is in moderation. Okay? Yukta har viharase. Everything yukta, moderation. But at the same time, while living in moderation, keep searching for that unseen power. Do not let go of your sight from that goal. So learn to use this but become a master of all this. This in, including not just the outer objects, even this body also. Got to use this body, but remember, I am the controller of this body. I am the owner of this body in this lifetime. But when I leave, I'm not the owner of this. If I was the owner, truly owner of this body, I should be able to take it with me. Nobody could do that. So we got to remember this. Just remember, Sanskrit term for culture is Sanskriti. And we have been given the Prakriti. Do not let it become Vikriti. And there's a Adhyatmic Sanskriti and then there's a Bhautik Sanskriti. So these are the terms I want you to remember. There's nothing good or bad. Got to just, it is there. We got to learn how to use it to refine ourselves, where ultimately we become one with that higher power. Okay? So I wanted you to just think it in this. I know most of this you already know, but still under the umbrella of the culture, remember this. And ultimately, if you boil it down, how to become more refined, Follow the yam and the niyams, which Rishi Patanjali beautifully explained in Yoga Sutras. Okay? So a cultured person will not hurt anybody, will not tell a lie, will not steal, will not hurt anybody, will not be greedy, will not be selfish, will do the duties, 
duties towards the family duties towards own body duty towards the nation community all those duties a cultured person, person will do it will not ignore it okay so adhyatmik person adhyatmik sanskriti does not mean run into the forests living over here but living above all this and keep on refining yourself okay so just remember that so so with this these definitions so how how is mentioned in yog sutras and bhagavad gita those are the textbooks that's why i always tell you bhagavad gita is a textbook on how to better yourself how to reform yourself that's a textbook verse by verse chapter by chapter that's what lord krishna teaches and in yog sutras rishi patanjali does the same thing sutra by sutra he is teaching us how to become more cultured how to refine ourselves to the level where we are so pure that we feel one with god who is the purest of all no blemish no sanskars no tendencies flawless that's where these rishis these gurus want us to be to that level om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnase purnamadaye purnameva visheshyate om shanti shanti shanti